Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Atlassian Governance Practices webinar. Uh, I'm Bonnie Beyer. I'm a delivery manager for Valiantis, and uh, my background is I uh, spent 20 some years in avionics, uh, working in engineering and engineering management and project management. And uh, the last five or so years of my career there, I got thrown over the wall to shared services and I led the Agile transformation and the Atlassian tools modernization activity there. And I, I had so much learning in that time and so much fun that uh, when things stabilized out, I decided to go ahead and uh, become a consultant so I can help other companies uh, learn from my mistakes. Um, Jason, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, sounds good. Jason Butner, I'm a head of practice for Enterprise Agility here at Valiantis, and um, really similar. I love hearing your story because when I had what I call my real job back in the industry, um, I was building project and portfolio management organizations, or at least part of the team to build them. And so a lot of what we're going to talk about here is pretty near and dear to my heart because we had to go through those pains and those challenges. In some cases, we did, I think, a pretty good job and arrived at a really good um, project and portfolio management, you know, construct for the company and had a lot of really good outcomes. And in other cases, we kind of muddled our way through it and learned a lot of things. So, and their end result was almost the same story you just shared, Bonnie, which was that um, I enjoyed it so much when well, we ran out of PMOs at the company to go build. So I had to go, go out into the consulting world so I could do it with companies all over and uh, followed that path for many, many years now. And I'm here with you today. So thanks for Tuning in, guys. We'll go through a little overview of the company when we say Valiantis. Who is Valiantis? Some of you guys watching this probably know. Uh, some of you might not. We are the number one Atlassian partner uh, for implementation of their, their platform and solution sets. And um, we are a platinum solution partner. We're global. Um, we have a North American business, European business. And just recently, we've uh, grown through acquisition to have uh, business in the APAC region. And so you can see all these credentials down here where we've just been, um, you know, targeting being the number one partner for Atlassian solution implementation. And I'll hand it back off to you, Bonnie, to get into the agenda for governance and what we're going to talk about here today. Yeah, so governance is, is a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, and it's something that I realized uh, when I presented at the Atlassian Summit in 2016, and then when I became a consultant in 2019, uh, that it's not something that a lot of companies really recognize as, uh, as a fundamental or foundational for their Atlassian tool suite, um, and, and it causes lots of pain. So the agenda, I typically go to the who, why, what, where, when kind of questions. So, uh, we're just going to give an overview of governance and then talk about why do we care about it? Uh, who is involved? How do you actually implement it? What are the practical steps that you have to take to make this happen? Um, I'll give a little bit of a demo as well uh, on what we uh, provide at, at Valiantis uh, for governance. And so let's jump right in. So what is governance? Well, Wikipedia defines it as the process of making and enforcing decisions within an organization or a society. And I tend to relate it to the three-legged stool of people, tools, and practices. You have to account for all three legs of that stool uh, evenly balanced or things are gonna tip over. And so you have to have uh, your representation um, you have to have a full understanding of what the roles and responsibilities are. And they have to have the authority to make those decisions for the organization. And that's why you do need to make sure you have a cross-sectional representation. So that way, um, every part of your business, all of the organization has some say in how things are, are governed in your system. The tools, uh, what are the tools that we use for governance? We need to make sure that we actually have our knowledge base fully documented. Most uh, organizations will do this either in Confluence or in SharePoint. Um, and then you wanna understand all the best practices and understand what are the decisions that we've made for governing our JIRA system. JIRA is the one place that seems to require the most governance 
Um, but that doesn't mean you ignored all of the other tools, Bitbucket, Confluence, and all of the other Atlassian tools or integrated system tools that are involved. And then your practices. Uh, what are our best practices? What's recommended versus required? Uh, and some things will be required for, for the reporting and some things will just be recommended. What are our design decisions? How have we architected the system? We need to make sure that we have that fully understood and communicated and documented so that as people join the organization or change roles, all of that information is still available for them. We see governance in all kinds of places. Engineering will see it in their development practices or configuration management, scope control on large customer programs. I used to work on five, 10 year aircraft programs and we would have our change control board boards where we would start discussing what scope is, is planned and what isn't planned. And, uh, and that change control board would govern the program to make sure that everything was uh, flowing according to the priorities uh, that we had for our, for our customers. IT historically has great governance over their enterprise tools, um, as well as the equipment and the servers. And IT is a great model for governance. Often though, what happens is that JIRA starts out as a grassroots kind of org uh, activity from engineering, and then it it gets handed over to IT and IT has to clean up the mess so that that often or we see it also with a lot of migrations or consolidations uh, acquisitions where people are bringing in different JIRA systems that have to merge uh, their governance practices or lack of governance uh, and so all of those things play into that as well. Why do we care about it? Well, we care about it because if you don't have a good mapping of your data in the system uh, and have uh, governed uh, steps for how uh, we interact with that data, how we manage it, what our workflows are, what, what uh, fields are, and, and how the whole system is architected and laid out, then we're not able to track that development life cycle from start to finish. And that's the goal is we really want to make sure that we can see all of the work from start to finish and that we can capture uh, all of the metrics that we wanna have, the reports. We wanna improve that executive visibility for dependencies, schedule, scope, risks, all of the different flow metrics that we might care about, uh, our objectives and our key results, all of that. We also want to improve that visibility operationally um, and make sure that we have good collaboration. Uh, these standards or, or guidance, this is really just setting guardrails to help people from going off the tracks and going over the cliff uh, because we've seen lots of systems uh, heading for that cliff. And so we, we want to try and pull back and say, okay, what is it we're trying to accomplish? So that way we can actually uh, set those guardrails in place to, to meet those objectives. And so <laughs> do any of these things sound familiar? We have something <laughs> in our consultants, uh, they sometimes find a system is, that has uh, several thousand custom fields or workflows or statuses. We also see uh, crazy workflows. This one's an example. I, I saw one at Rockwell Collins that, that was really eye-opening as to how crazy it can really get. And, and these are things that indicate that you have a governance issue. If when you go into a bulk edit and you have to scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll through all of the fields, um, and there's hundreds and hundreds of fields uh, in the system, that bulk edit becomes very painful. Uh, if you're doing a JQL search and setting up your dashboards and you're not sure which statuses to use and you, you're, all of the statuses that are available are, are confusing, uh, the end user confusion and the garbage in, garbage out aspect of your data will really make uh, any productive dashboard reporting capabilities or even your DevOps solutions uh, suspect. And you, you don't want a garbage in, garbage out situation. So if you see anything like this, or even just you know several dozen issue types or hundreds of custom fields, then maybe there's some room for improvement in the governance of your system. So we often call this the wild, wild west when we see this, or sometimes we call it the Franken Jira. Um, the JIRA configuration does say a lot about it. So these are the, some of the questions that we often ask our, our, uh, 
our consultants uh, have them review this when they're doing a JIRA health check. Um, do most of the projects have their own issue types and workflow schemes? If they're not using shared schema sets and, and project templates, then they probably have things starting to get out of control. Uh, several dozen issue types, multiple versions of the done status, <laughs> done, complete, closed, finished. I remember seeing one that was not just done, but it was done, done, because we don't trust it that it's actually done until it's done, done. <laughs> I've seen percentages used for statuses, which are definitely not a, a good way to go. Um, I remember seeing a Atlassian Summit or Atlassian Teams event. It's called that now, but back in my day, it was the summit, right? Um, I saw a presentation where they were uh, establishing governance and cleaning up their system, and they had over 600 different versions of done. Um, that's, that's definitely counter to, to good practices. Actually, I typically recommend that you only just need two ending statuses, but it, your, your results may vary. Uh, resolution values, those can be another uh, common area where there might be problems, uh, custom fields. Are your admins trained? Uh, do they have enough experience uh, to not need a certification in the training? Uh, because uh, if we actually have a very recent uh, client doing a health check where the lack of training has resulted in them having so many licenses for their JIRA service management that they are paying uh, about $12,000 a month for licenses when really they could get by with maybe about $1,000 a month uh, for those. So immediately we see a major savings there. And do they have several dozen people with admin permissions? That means you have way too many cooks in the kitchen and you can't control that system. So if the answer to some of these questions is yes, then you probably do need some governance in your system. Uh, some of the common challenges you need to address for a governance board is, of course, those wild, wild west configurations. Uh, we need to define what is our architecture going to be and what is it that we really want the system's future state to look like. You want to address permissions and security issues, all of the roles and org administration, as well as down to the project level administration. You want to address that end user support and that end user uh, confusion. Make sure that they're enabled to use the tools appropriately, that they understand these are the best practices or the ways that we want to use the tools at this company. And that they also know how to ask for help. Where do they reach out for support? Where do they reach out when they need training or when they need somebody else onboarded onto their team? Admin training and system cleanup. And then of course your PMO and your agile support or your DevOps integrations all of these things are things that are going to come up. Uh, governance is not a one-time activity. It starts out where you're defining your future state and your architecture of your system, but it is a long-lived activity that continues to govern the system and make the decisions for how it will evolve over time so that you can get all of the true value out of the system. And so how? Uh, how do we do this? Well, you start with the who. Uh, and you want to get um, who are the people that are going to be, stand up this governance board? Who are the people that are going to be involved? Uh, you may name it the Atlassian Tools Governance Board, the JIRA Advisory Board, um, the change, uh, ALM Change Control Board. That's what we call it at my uh, avionics company. Uh, but the important aspect is who those people are. You want to make sure that you have somebody who's the product owner. This would be the person that has the final decision-making authority. Now, everybody's gonna be voting or, or having their voices heard, but you may not always be able to come to consensus. So somebody has to have the ownership uh, and the authority uh, to make those decisions, those final uh, tiebreaker type decisions. You need to have your admins involved uh, and other integration uh, support representatives. They're the ones that are gonna be able to tell you what is the impact uh, how much effort is it going to be for us to implement this? Is this going to have impact to other systems? So you have to have those admins involved. And then, of course, you also want to have representatives from across the entire organization, not just the admins, not just that product owner, but also people that are actually in charge of the teams that are using those tools or some subject matter experts for these different teams. The people that are using the tools are the ones that you're going to want uh, 
to be able to tell them what we need, why we need it, help justify those business cases for the changes that they're requesting. Some of the activities that they're going to do, uh, they're going to start out by establishing what is our vision, what are our goals, and what, how do we operate as a team. Uh, and they're going to need to understand what is the scope of responsibility for our governance board? What tools do we support? Uh, and what is our support model? Uh, does it include uh, our end user training and all of the support systems? Or do we have multiple governance boards with different responsibilities in the areas? Uh, so they're going to have to define that. Then one of the very first activities they need to implement or identify, I mean, they need to identify and document and implement what their JIRA architecture will be. What is it going to look like? What is our data map uh, and, and the structure of our JIRA projects uh, in our data? What fields do we want to include? What are the workflows? How many different project template types do we need to have to support all of the different types of teams that are working in our system? So they're going to define that future state. And then after it's baselined uh, and after they've converted all of their existing uh, teams over into that, then it, they're not going to have to meet as frequently. They'll be able to pull back to monthly because they'll just be reviewing change requests or maintenance activities. Uh, they might look at upgrades if they're in data center. Um, and they may be looking at the continuous e evolution of their system, what PMO or uh, agile tooling uh, or LPM or continue uh, improvements in our DevOps solutions. Uh, all of those things will be continue to, to build uh, over time. So this will be a team uh, governance board that will continue to operate indefinitely. And so you may have to rotate people in uh, to get that diverse uh, uh, background from the organization, as well as people get tired of it, I'm done, I'm gonna nominate this other person to start filling in that position. One of the things that they will need to do is to consider all of the aspects of a change when a change request comes in. I, I hear it quite often, well, it's a free plugin, so let's just try it out. There is no such thing as a free plugin, no. There is no such thing as a free plugin. Every plugin is going to have some sort of impact on, on your end users and on your system configuration. Uh, it may be introducing new fields or new issue types or new link types. Uh, and so never ever install a free plugin into your production environment without first evaluating in your test environment first and making sure you understand what those impacts are and that you're able to provide all of the end user support and guidance uh, that's necessary for that tool. Um, so they need to consider all of those aspects. So uh, one of the things that they're gonna do up front, of course, is name their governance board and then establish their vision and their purpose. And we have a couple of examples here. Uh, our governance vision is to ensure an ongoing balance uh, between enterprise goals and enterprise growth by a flexible controls managed by the employees who best understand the purpose and value of the Atlassian products across the organization. The key word I underlined there is balance, that we are looking for it to be uh, a system that is only uh, restricted in terms of the things that absolutely must be restricted and everything else is flexible and is decided by the end users how they use it best. Uh, so you want that balance. You want to provide guidance, provide best practices. But when it comes to the things that aren't required uh, to be uh, set a certain way, uh, do not uh, put more uh, restrictions in place than are necessary. And then a purpose. The purpose is related to that scope of responsibility. We want to support the creation discussion, decision, and implementation of those Atlassian products, applications, components, and configuration. Jason, any thoughts on, on the governance board vision or purpose there? Well, what I really like in the vision is the balance aspect that you shared. Um, I think from our shared stories that we've talked about with each other, we've lived that where you know, sometimes people are doing quite well on their own, 
you know, they're managing their corner of the earth and they have all the right fields in place, you know, the right workflows in place, the right, everything they need for their responsibilities. And they hear governance and they think, uh oh, you know, it's like the old, I'm with the government and I'm here to help feeling, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so I understand that feeling and, um, you know, and then at the same time, you've got the business saying, hey, we need data up here at the decision making level and we can't get it because everything's crazy. The Wild West, like you said. And so, you know, I think that balance that you talked about is so important. You brought up a term like healthy guardrails. You know, I think that's really like the the vision there is there's some guardrails and you can do a pretty good job. It doesn't have to be like a lose-lose scenario. It doesn't have to be a compromise negotiation where everybody lose, loses a little bit and comes away a little bit upset. I, what I've seen is, you know, through engagements that you've led, Bonnie, and the customers we've talked to is that they're really pleased that really in the end, the users of the system and the admins felt like they had a better system than they had before they started. And certainly the executives are excited because, oh my gosh, I'm already starting to see data that I never saw before. Yeah. And then what that unlocks typically is like, okay, now we have other tools and systems in place that were built in our old configuration environment that were pretty disparate. Now, what are the next steps? And we can talk about that later on in this uh, series here, but what are the next steps I can do to really extract and use that data to supercharge my business? So I just really like that uh, you point this vision out and I think it's really important so that, you know, people aren't getting, they're not losing something that they had before, but really gaining. Yeah. I, you know, it, it makes me think of when, uh, when we were adopting the Atlassian tools at, at Rockwell, Rockwell Collins, which is the avionics company I work for, there was a huge product line, uh, ProLine uh, Fusion, for a avionics flight deck, huge uh, or part of our organization at that point. And they'd been using uh, you know, spreadsheets for something that they were, that was a critical aspect of the certification and audit process. Uh, and it was, had, was phase gate. I mean, we weren't truly agile at that point, um, but they thought that they had to do it in a certain way. And so <laughs> we honestly, we spent, $2 million building a custom plugin to recreate this in JIRA before they would onboard. It was their one requirement. We will not onboard into JIRA until we have this capability because it was so critical to their success. And we built it, but then once they got into JIRA, that $2 million plugin that we developed never got used, never, because they started finding all these other great ways to use JIRA to do what they needed. So it really, uh, what often happens is people will find out, oh, I didn't know I could do that instead. Oh, that's a better solution. That's more elegant. Oh, I like that. So that's part of those guardrails as well and that balance. And don't throw away money until you truly understand the need and the possible wow. options. <laughs> that's huge. So we have our uh, governance goals and uh, the different components. So you can see the goals here in the center here. We want to be able to scale. We want this to be a system that uh, can be uh, scalable across the entire organization. We want visibility uh, over the system to be able to see all of the scope as it propagates uh, from the high level initiatives all the way down to the tasks so that, um, so that all of it rolls up and you have your appropriate reporting. We want it to be owned by the end users. We want them to have that ownership in how it's designed and how it should be used. Uh, so pull those subject matter experts in. If you got some of those, uh, what's the, uh, I heard you once call them the, the prima donnas. If you have some of those people that are truly saying, no, it must be this way. They're the ones you want on that governance board. You want them involved in making the decisions. You want them educated on the options. And then they can truly understand, okay, yes, this is what I need. And these are the options. And they can help you evaluate what's the best solution that we want to adopt. Yeah. And you need knowledge sharing. Knowledge sharing is incredibly important. That knowledge base for our company design uh, specific decisions and knowledge sharing across 
best practices for all of the different uh, end users and organizations that are using the tools. Uh, we've used communities of practices, lunch and learns, um, all of that knowledge sharing. There's so many different ways you can go about doing it. Make sure you are doing it. Around the center, or around the peripheral, we got all the different components that go into it. Of course, we've got our JIRA and our source control. We want portfolio. We're going to lean on Atlassian a lot for a lot of the information they have. You don't want to recreate the wheel. Uh, you don't want to have to maintain everything that Atlassian is maintaining for you, all of their great documentation. You only want to you know, have your knowledge base on your company-specific uh, decisions or best practices. You want that framework for your actual governance activities, and you want to define who the different governing bodies are. There's going to be other organ portions of your IT tooling systems that are going to interact with that, and they may have other governing bodies. You're also going to have maybe a lean agile center of excellence or agile transformation team, or, or if it's you know hybrid or waterfall or, or whatever your methodologies are, you're going to have somebody, uh, some governing body that owns the procedures. They need to interact with these people as well. Your best practices and your policies and confluence is certainly one of the components as well. So whatever this looks like for your organization, you'll want to think about what are exactly the goals we're trying to achieve. And you can borrow these if you like. Um, and then what are the different components uh, that are involved as well? I've got a quick, quick thought on this is, you know, as I've gone out and talked with different customers of ours and, and shown this slide, this, I actually went back through the archives of our governance series here, which we'll share again later. There's a link that you can go to and you can see years and years of these webinars worth of governance series. And this goes back, like, I want to say six years or something like that, this slide. So it's kind of an oldie and you can kind of see it and look and you can see it's kind of older look, but, but it's so true. And it's a good slide. And a lot of people really take some value in those uh, four uh, objectives in the center. I'll just quickly point out a recent customer I was talking with um, has experienced incredible growth in asset holdings and revenue. And that's great, right? But there was a certain milestone in their growth in asset holdings that opened them up to um, pretty, serious, pretty serious compliance auditing. And um, that because there was inconsistency across the business in maturity of teams or ways of working or, you know, reporting and data, uh, you know, data consistency. Uh, what happened was it really stunted the growth. And now the business is taking effort that they were using to fuel the growth of the company and taking all that, those people and putting them toward um, reporting and data massaging and transformation and everything so that they can, um, you know, pass all of these audits and compliance checks. And it, there's been a noticeable stunting of growth for the company. It, they can feel it. They can see it. The data reveals it. And they're not tolerating it. So from their viewpoint, they're very interested in growing in this governance arena because they know what they need is capability wall to wall. They no longer can live in a world where some teams can be kind of weaker, some stronger, or some teams use this data and other teams use this other data. They need to be consistent from wall to wall so that they can quickly, you know, and their goal is to automate that reporting. And the right. way you do that is through governance. So it's, this will unlock this, this will re unlock their growth. And as we go through the story with them, I'd love to have them on a webinar like this someday and be able to share their story themselves about how it unlocked their growth. Yeah. Well, what you said about automating the reports is it's, there's so much that we can do when it comes to automation, when it comes to uh, with our DevOps, as well as with our reporting or other types of uh, automations. But I, I often think of Rosie the robot, you know, from the Jetsons. Rosie the robot, I, I would love for her to go into my kitchen and be able to cook my dinner um, and clean up the kitchen afterwards. But in order for Rosie to be able to do that, she's got to have that mapping. She's got to know where all the canned goods are, where all the dishes are, where the silverware is. She needs to know where the sink is, where the produce is. She needs that mapping. She needs that mapping. And, and that's what governance really is intended to help you build is what is our mapping of our data? 
uh, how is it structured in our system and how is it managed? Uh, so that way we can have Rosie the robot going in and doing all those great automations for us. And so uh, I mentioned before, you know, when you stand up your governance board, uh, they're going to have to build their architecture. And so the architectural decisions, uh, some of the examples are listed here. Uh, we can see uh, good old Steve Tremus uh, and our CEO, Michael. Um, they were, uh, this is from a, a governance uh, on-site boot camp that was held. Uh, but, you know, those governance decisions that they're going to need to make are similar to like, what is the layer, what are the layers of scale? What's the hierarchy of data in our system? Do we, are we following a full safe configuration with themes, initiatives, capabilities, features, stories, subtests, or do we have something in, uh, down to just, we're just using uh, stories and ep Jira epics and maybe initiatives. We just need three layers of scale or somewhere in between. What is our layer of scale? What is that hierarchy of our system? What's that scope of responsibility? The governance board does need to define that up front. That's one of the architectural decisions that they need to make. What are the different components of our system and what are the responsibilities for us in terms of end user support, design uh, and uh, knowledge bases or end user enablement? What is our JIRA configuration structure? Uh, this one is one that uh, really is fundamental uh, to, your, to that data map. How is our, our data structured in our system? Then start thinking about what are our portfolio and our program level requirements? What are, we, what are the things that we need for our project managers or uh, product owners or product managers or whatever the role is called in your organization? What do they need to be able to do their job? Uh, what are the different reporting capabilities that we need? Maybe they're trying to implement lean portfolio management uh, and that requires a good structure as well to be able to pull up the financial data appropriately. And what are the team level customizations uh, and integrations that are needed? Those teams, they're the ones that are doing the work that your company is selling. Uh, and so we need to make sure we're not optimizing for just one section like the portfolio and ignoring what those team level customizations are. Uh, we need to make sure that we're keeping that in mind when we're building out our, our architectural design. Uh, we may need multiple team templates. We may have a lot of different diverse teams uh, in terms of how they operate and what integrations they need. And that's okay. That is okay. So long as those integration points, those uh, those uh, best practices or, or guardrails that we have set in place for how our workflows will operate at certain levels in the hierarchy uh, are adhered to. So, and so we need to consider all of these things when we're, when we're looking at our uh, architectural decisions. So let's get into a demo. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into, I'm gonna exit the slides for a little bit. We'll come back to them in a bit. But um, one of the things I like to show is, is an Atlassian governance board. And so this is in our demo environment. Uh, this would be an example of what you might see in an Atlassian governance board uh, confluence space. The way this is structured uh, is we have three sections here. We have our governance practices, we have our Atlassian administration, and we have our knowledge base. Now, what I have found with different companies is they may have some of these in various places, um, but they're scattered all over the place. And it's okay if you have an Atlassian administration confluence space or SharePoint where all of their documentation is, and you have maybe your ALM user guide or handbook or whatever it is for your knowledge base um, those in another space or SharePoint. It, they don't have to all live in this one space, but what I have found more often is that they're scattered pages. Some of them are in personal spaces, some of them are in SharePoint, some of, the, some of them are in the admin's head. That's the worst place for them to be is in that admin's head because that admin's gonna win the lottery. Um, and when that admin wins the lottery, um, then you're going to be really stuck. So make sure that you have all of these things captured in a central repository, wherever it is, and that you can find them. Uh, if, if at some point you can't say, okay, where, where do the admins keep the maintenance activities? Uh, if, if their first question is what maintenance activities, then you already know you have a problem. But if their second thought is 
Well, um, we have some of them here and we have some of them here and, oh, and Tom does that stuff. And so he, I think he's got that on his, uh, on his PC, on his uh, hard drive. That's not good. Make sure that you're pulling all of that information together. And so we've structured it in these three categories. And so I'll, I'll start with the governance. Uh, no, actually I'll start with the Atlassian administration section. And this section, we can see that we've got naming conventions, We've got our run books for the common activities, such as when they create a new JIRA project, what are the steps that they're going to go through? Uh, they're going to create them perhaps based on shared schema sets. So what are the different options for those shared schema sets? What are the project templates that we're using for our different team levels or for our different program or portfolio levels? Uh, they're also going to have, how do we manage our change requests? And they're going to have their maintenance activities uh, including yearly housekeeping activities or their sandbox updates. How do we, they manage those? Uh, if it's a data center, they likely have uh, plans for their upgrades uh, and run books associated with those. Or if they're planning a new deployment of a new uh, plugin, like maybe uh, maybe Easy Agile, they want the program boards or something like that, or Big Picture or any of these types of plugins. Uh, they that's introducing some great new functionality. So the admins are going to have uh, their run books on what the, are the steps. And so all of that will be captured in their, uh, in their Atlassian administration section. Notice I didn't put uh, any real uh, documentation on our architectural structure or administration, uh, because except for the naming conventions, most of that will actually live in our knowledge base. And so we'll have certain information about our, our JIRA configuration. What are the different project categories that we've uh, defined? Uh, and how do we define those? Uh, what, what do they look like? And so we might have an enterprise project category. And so we wanna define this is this type of template and it's intended for these high, hierarchical levels. Ugh, I can talk. It's defined for these hierarchical levels, in this case, the portfolio and enterprise leadership. And it's to track these types of issue types at this hierarchical level. Uh, so uh, you might even include your uh, template project links. Um, and then you'll have just enough information for the admins to know exactly which uh, issue type schemes and workflow schemes, all of the different schema sets they're going to use, and a little bit of a description. You're not going to recreate all of the all of the administration in your doc user base knowledge base. Um, this is really just a handoff to communicate to the end users. This is what this project category has. Uh, you may have certain workflow uh, information, so you could have include some uh, workflow details, or if you have certain custom fields associated with this particular project type, you would include that. But this is not intended to be a full documentation of your administration because if anybody's ever tried to document uh, the JIRA configuration in a in in something that they, they know how crazy and insane it is with the with the how many schemes? I think there's eight schemes associated with each project. I think they're all listed here, right? Uh, there's seven here. So seven different schema sets. Um, and the different layers of those schema sets and things that go into the screen schemes and the issue type screen schemes and things like that. So you don't want to recreate all that documentation. You just want what's necessary for that end user to admin communication handoff. But then uh, you also, so you'll have those defined for all of your project categories, but then you'll also have links to your Atlassian. Uh, you're going to want to link to all of the Atlassian documentation. Like I said, you don't want to recreate what Atlassian provides for free, and they're maintaining it. You don't want to have to maintain it. Uh, so that that would I see that happening in a lot of companies, and they think they're doing such great, giving great information to their end users, and they are, but it's a point in time, and Atlassian is going to continue to evolve their system and improve it. Are you going to have to go back and update all of that documentation? And are you going? To, what's going to be the prompt? Are you going to know that? Oh, they made this change. I need to remember to go change this page and this information. Don't do that. Instead, pro provide links to the documentation that Atlassian provides. Instead, though, what you do want to give is your company-specific best practices or guidance. Maybe it's on. This is how we set up our advanced roadmaps. The way we think is best 
for our project managers, or this is how we do our sprint naming conventions, or this is our labels taxonomy and, and how we use labels in our system. Uh, whatever those decisions are for what's best for the organization and how we use the tools, those should be documented in your knowledge base and those should be maintained and kept up to date. Similar with Confluence, you're gonna to wanna to have the same kind of information. Uh, so, and you may build some specific page templates uh, for your organizations. Maybe you have engineering estimates. Uh, and so those will be uh, templates that you would build for your company. So you wanna document those here. Uh, you don't wanna recreate documentation about all the different templates that Atlassian provides. That's available from Atlassian. But that's your knowledge base section. Just enough information for the admin to end user handoff and then about the company specific documentation for the best practices and uh, architectural designs. And then governance itself. The governance section, uh, we wanna make sure that we're actually uh, documenting what is our ways of working? How do, when do we meet? Who's involved? Who are the people that are in, uh, in our governance board? You might have your, your guidance and your best practices for how your system is defined, uh, including all of the different reasons for what, how many JIRA admins we have, or what is our layout and design, uh, user management and security, all of these different best practices. And then you'll have your decision log. And your decision log will start out focused on uh, what is our architectural baseline. So you might have, uh, what are what is our hierarchy of our system? How do how do we define the hierarchy in our system, and how many different levels are we considering? And we may start out with just three levels of scale, or you may have five layers of scale. Uh, really, you have options, but you want to make those decisions and communicate them uh, through your uh, decision logs. You'll have your project category structures. What, how do we set up our data? What is our topology for our data? Are we organizing all of our layers of scale in a single JIRA project? Are we breaking them out into multiple projects and how does that operate? There are pros and cons uh, for all of these different options. But if you have a mix of these different options within your system, there's likely, uh, there's like, likely a lot of challenge with trying to pull that information up into common reporting or into common integrations. And so you'll want to have those considerations in mind when you're defining what is our data topology uh, for our uh, JIRA system. You wanna define what are our different project categories? What are our JIRA service management project categories? What are our workflow practices? Especially our starting and ending practices are, uh, I, I have very strong opinions about this, about having a, a dual ending and a single starting and everything else in between is really <laughs> dependent on the issue type and the uh, team template. Uh, but th those are different things that the, the company can decide uh, and build out their architectural uh, decisions. They'll have their global configuration settings, their look and feel, uh, their defaults for notifications or, or for um, upload of file sizes, all of those different baseline decisions that need to be made. What are the resolutions? What are our link types, et cetera, et cetera. As time goes on, this decision log will grow and grow and grow. But these fundamental decisions will be made up front. And then you'll be able to, you know, maybe organize it by year or whatever, but you'll start getting in change requests. So then the decision log will be, we've gotten a request for a custom field for organizational change request information. Okay, well, what does that field mean? Why do they need it? What, is, what are they trying to accomplish with this field? And so they'll build out that page, the champion will build out why they care about this with an overview and, and, uh, and then the action items and decisions we made, and it'll be fully captured for everybody uh, to have that information. You can do that in JIRA too or you can use the power of Confluence to be able to integrate with JIRA so that you have your Kanban board of all of your decision-making uh, or governance practices and activities uh, in, in that appropriate JIRA system. But then you have your documentation of all of the background information fully captured in Confluence or SharePoint as well. 
And so that decision log will be uh, something that will be used. You'll also, your governance practices will also include your change request process, your support models, your training models, and your communication model. When some things need to be communicated up front. Some things you just need to send out an information afterwards. Some things don't need communication at all. Some of them you have to say it seven times in order for it to sink in. So uh, having a well-defined communication uh, plan for your governance uh, board is, is really valuable as well. And so this is just an example of, of how I would model a governance, uh, a governance board uh, and have our schedule and mission statement and our purpose up front, as well as our membership of who's involved, who's the product owner, uh, who's, uh, who are the admins, and what is the scope of our tools. And so however you want to document it in your organization, where you want to document it is fine. So long as you have it in, it's, as long as somebody is able to say, yes, we have that, it's over here, then I'm happy. But if they say, well, we got some over here, some over here, and some of it's in Tom's head, then we know we have a problem. So, all right, so let's go back to the... Do we have any questions, by the way? Feel free to put some questions in the chat um, or in the Q&A section. Uh, we'll be happy to take any questions. Jason. Yeah, wow. I mean, that's, that's really powerful. And um, I wish we had this when I had my quote unquote real job. <laughs> so seriously, um, I think that's a standout too. And I just want to, you know, what makes us stand out just as a little segue. When we work with our clients, we work in the system. This isn't, you know, a bunch of spreadsheets. We're not doing the engagement in PowerPoint or Microsoft Word, and it's all disparate. We're doing it in the system. And what you just saw was, is just really powerful. And um, some of the clients we worked with, you know, really appreciate the fact that when we do our engagements, we do it in the system. So, um, you know, curiosity, values, customer centric. I just want to kind of look at that middle one for a second on this slide. What makes us stand out? Um, when I came to Valiantis, one thing, I used to be a customer, actually. So just full disclosure, I was a customer. Um, I saw empathy. I saw a commitment to value. And when I worked with the company, um, I got more value than I felt like I was even paying for. The experience that I had as a customer was like, wow, I'm getting a really good deal here because they're just working they're just providing value and then lo and behold i discovered that the the tagline that's internally preached within the company is that we are to provide value at every interaction and um our you know bonnie mentioned one of our ceos michael mcneil has always told um everybody in the company don't even pick up the phone if you don't have something valuable to share we're not going to be like other companies that you know, you got all these calls and you have all this interaction where it's not providing value, it's doing something else. But anyway, that I felt that as a customer and then come to work at the company, it's, you know, it's ingrained. So next slide. Um, you know, this is fine, splash screen. I mean, there, we, we have a lot of customers. And so the next slide, um, this is just something, I want to talk a little bit about the value here of, governance because my eyes are opening a little bit i've seen like i said my own experiences bonnie shared her experiences but from the executives that i talk with you know and so there's the users the admins the folks in management and then there's kind of the executives out there you know you've probably heard data is the new oil or the new gold you can see the quote there um but three things that that really governance provides for you visibility a lot of folks i talk to in leadership do not have a clear line of sight into what teams are working on and some of those clogs are due to the fact that the configuration of the business and the data is disparate it's different all the stuff we've been talking about today 
All right. Another pain that I hear a lot is just consistency. It's not consistent. Consistent, reliable data reaches decision makers swiftly. Um, it's not just that inconsistent data is inconsistent. It's that now there's a clog and I can't get the decisions, the decision making data I need quickly. All right. Yeah, I finally got the report. It was a month after the fact that that stuff happened and it was too late to do anything about it now. And so um, businesses are moving faster and faster than ever before. Changes are happening quickly. Reprioritization um, of objectives. It's all happening very quickly. And if the data can't keep up with the need for decision making speed, uh, there's problems and consistency creates a lot of that problem. Um, and new insights. I think this is where the gold really is. Um, they mentioned and yeah, exactly. A little, little thumb drive gold. Um, advanced analytics, fresh insights. Um, the two things in there are operational opportunities inside of your business are inefficiencies, um, little cost hogs that are sucking up cost. Um, you know, your ability for throughput and feature releases and things like that, that um, you, you, you think you have a capacity issue, but there's the possibility that if you had your business unlocked through good governance, you could actually release twice as many features as you do. You could have a higher throughput, not have to hire a single person. Um, that's oftentimes the case actually with a lot of the clients we work with. And then what does that lead to? Untapped market potential. Think about it. If you have to, if you, if you don't even have to hire anybody and you could release twice the digital content out into the world. What does that do for your ability to, to attract new customers or provide your customers with higher value than they're getting right now? I mean, this is real market potential. And so data is the new gold. And um, I think what we're doing in the governance world is exciting to me. The word itself. I mean, if we're all just honest, governance isn't the most exciting word in the English language, but what it provides is these things. All right. And it's real value. So if you go to the next slide, we, um, I have done a fair amount of business consulting with actually looking at business cases for companies. So some of this data that we use comes from previous engagements we've had, and we benchmark this. Some of it comes from market benchmarking. And a lot of it comes through, honestly, the most valuable thing is just to facilitate business case workshopping with our clients. Um, it doesn't have to be really heavy, but it has to be real. And it has to be something that you guys are willing to sign up for. But some of the things Bonnie mentioned earlier, the cost savings, um, these are real things. These are real cost savings our customers have experienced. So if you look at just cost savings of kind of on the low end, and what she was describing was kind of low end cost savings, 120,000 a year, $10,000 a month. Oh my gosh, like that far outstrips right there, the cost of, an, of a governance engagement um, that we do with our clients. But then you look and you go, you look at the market opportunities we just discussed and, uh, and other efficiencies. And again, on the low end, you're talking about probably seven figures. Okay, this is what we've experienced. And I put question marks in there because with some of the larger companies we work with, um, that number can get extremely high. And I didn't even wanna put it on the screen because you guys would probably just laugh thinking how could governance possibly lead to market benefit that's that high? And so I'll just leave it at that. But the point is, is that the business case far outstrips the cost of the engagement itself. And we can discover that with you and work together to build that. Um, and then the next two slides are really just how do you do it? So um, inside of this on the left side, um, we have webinars like we're doing right now. This is an example of provide value at every interaction. This is absolutely free. We're not gonna ever charge somebody for a webinar. Some of the things that a lot of the content that Bonnie shared in and of itself is extremely valuable. You could copy paste what you learned here today and kind of be off to the races with some of these ideas in your own business. And at least that's what we hope and that's what we hear from some of our customers. The middle one here is the governance workshop. That's if you wanna take it to the next level we schedule these um, regularly, and it's a one-day hands-on 
Uh, we just had our first one recently. And Bonnie, just really quickly, what, what do you think would be your testimony on how that went? Yeah, actually, so we, we typically do this as a private workshop with a governance board. Um, but we did just recently do a public one. That was our first time doing a public one with a, a group of people that were from other organizations, multiple organizations. I couldn't believe how, how great it went. It was so fantastic because we had insights coming from all kinds of different directions. And what, the idea though is that you do want uh, people thinking of a single company. So we decided we were the Acme Anvils and Rockets company. Me, me. <laughs> <laughs> But, I love the uh, Wild West. Yeah, something like that. But yeah, it was interesting because yeah. one person asked, well, how do I sell this governance, the need for governance to my leadership? And I started to answer the question, but immediately several other people from the class started answering for me. Oh, talk about the risk reductions, talk about the cost savings, talk about this and that. And so I was like, yeah, but also we have the webinar. Um, you can send your, your leadership to the webinar. But yeah, yeah. So, yeah it went great. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's good to hear. It's another example of, you know, it's a very, very low investment to get your teams to, to join that. And um, it's a good starter and really good starter. Um, we want to enable you guys to do this work yourselves. Okay. And so you might learn enough there to get on the beginning of a good journey. And then if you really want to, a lot of times with, uh, for example, and it doesn't have to be this way, but our cloud consolidation and migrations. Um, it's a, just a really opportunistic time to say, hey, here's all this data. And we had to deal with it all at once. And it kind of highlighted to our business that we need to do something pretty serious. And so a lot of times on the back end of that, or it doesn't have to be, it could be before it, um, we'll do a, an actual engagement. And that can be like you see here, you know, two, three, four months kind of a thing. And, um, you know, we're, we're hand in hand with you guys and doing a, a, a straight up engagement. And we're not talking about just like dabbling. We're wanting to really do the things that Bonnie was sharing there. Many of our customers have done that and uh, it's big. So uh, when I say big, I mean, I mean, it's a big benefit. It's all of what we re we've been talking about. Um, and so uh, the only thing I would say kind of in addition to that on the next slide is that again, you do that, you get everything in that stable spot. It's like you built a strong foundation. Your house is on a rock, you know, it's, it's solid, it's ready to go up. And so on that maturity curve, which we work with a lot of our clients on uh, going on a journey together through strategic advisory, um, then maybe you begin moving way up the ladder on that maturity curve and doing additional work to extract the value of that data now, which could be JSM and managed services, custom solutions, agility, and, uh, and beyond eventually having what we call and work with Atlassian on um, implementing a connected enterprise or a system of work where your entire Atlassian ecosystem in your company is interconnected with the rest of your company at such a level that you're operating through a real connected enterprise and not this distributed disconnected amalgamation or the Franken-Jira that was mentioned earlier, you know, and you're just really getting all the outcomes that you've desired. So governance can be a great beginning. We kind of look at it as the beginning of that journey. And we'd love to go on that with you. So some of those resources, I think we got, if, if you go to uh, two slides ahead, we have, um, an events calendar. Uh, we have a YouTube channel that has our entire governance series and lots and lots of content. And you can see here that we've got a lot of upcoming uh, value and different events that we're doing as well. We'd love to get started, whether it's the webinars, the workshop, or an engagement. Um, we could begin that journey with you. Yeah. And I don't know if there's there's something in the chat. I didn't know if that, okay, that's some links. Excellent, awesome. But please reach out if you have questions. Yeah, and we're running close to one hour here, but one question I often get is, what is the biggest impediment to governance or what's the biggest challenge? And uh, lack of authority, 
or lack of follow through. Uh, whether they don't have the authority, they don't have the executive backing to make the decisions that they need to make to, to bring those guardrails into place. That's the first thing that I see. Uh, the second thing I see uh, is the lack of follow through. They may even start with governance or they may even start with a G JSM solution or a, a new JIRA implementation uh, or some custom development or, or practice with with a tempo implementation or, or JIRA line or whatever. Um, but then the follow through to keep maintain that governance over that system and maintain that governance over that solution that falls through the cracks. Uh, and so over time, it, 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 the value is lost. Uh, so those would be uh, authority and follow through are the things, the two biggest challenges. Do we have any other questions from the group? I don't see any. So we are at the top of the hour, though. So Jason, thank you so much. I had fun. I thought it was a we. we I Me think too. it's our best so far. <laughs> I think so too. I was thinking the exact same thing. So hopefully our customers think the same thing. <laughs> All right. Yep. Have a great rest of your afternoon, everyone. Yep. Take care. Bye -bye.